You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 396, Revelation 21 and 22, part 1. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike. How you doing? (laughs) Hey, Trey. How you doing? (laughs) Yeah. It's my turn. It's my turn. No, I I really want to thank everybody. Uh, I know everybody's been praying for me, so I had a, a bout of COVID. I was in the hospital for a week. Uh, I'm out, obviously, now at home recovering. Uh, I'm good. You know, my oxygen levels aren't as high as we want. You know, I'm on oxygen, um, but I'm fine. I'm slowly recovering. It's just going to take time. Uh, You can probably hear it in my voice. But um, uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody that's emailed me and and, uh, been praying for me. It means a lot to me. Uh, Mike, it really is a great community we have here for the podcast. And I know you felt the love too. So it's my turn to feel some love. And I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, you know, I'm glad to still be here. <laughs> yeah, well, we're obviously we're glad you're still here. Yeah, I, it, I, I'll confess, you know, I was I was worried, you know, because you you had a little bit of a you know, some extra factors that COVID could really make a problem. So I was concerned, and but you, I mean, to me, you sound good. I, I know you're not where you you typically are, but it's just nice to hear you, and and you're not like desperate for air. I mean, yeah. Yeah. As long as you don't make just, me yeah, get up and run around. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. I have yeah. asthma. So, you know, my asthma was a big concern. Of course, it, it, it probably had a factor in, in uh, you know, my COVID issue, but uh, uh, I'm good. You know, I, as long as I don't stand up too fast and run around, you know, it, everything's mm-hmm. fine. I am on oxygen. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that helps, but hopefully every day will get better. I'm on steroids for like a month. So it's just kind of like one of those deals where you just got to wait and see what happens, uh, how your body yeah. responds, well, make, you know, and make sure you have everybody else chase the dog. And you, yeah. you, now you have a good excuse to, to have people wait on you. you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, it's a good excuse to get back in shape, you know, so I got to get off my butt and quit being lazy. And uh, so that motivates yeah. you, you know, more than anything. So again, I just want to, Thank everybody out there, you know, continued prayers for me and you, Mike, you know, Mike, it's your turn. How are you doing? What's the latest with you? Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel free to send some of your weight over here. I mean, I can <laughs> sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, no, we, this would normally be, we're, we're recording this on what would normally have been a, a chemo week, but we, we skipped the four cycle to um, basically to see if we can deduce whether it contributes significantly to my gastrointestinal problems, which is a, which is a nice scientific way of referring to my diarrhea problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can eat normally so that, that there's, there's some positives here. I can eat normally. I can, in theory, eat anything. I had a steak last week. It was just wonderful. Um, so I don't have any of those sorts of issues, but everything I eat and I'm, I'm up to 22, 2300 calories a day. But it just runs right through me, so I I can't gain weight, and and if I, you go into into chemo, it, it'll it'll take five or six pounds from me every time I do it. So I that's five or six pounds right now that I'll never see again. You know, it, it's it's one of those sorts of cycles. So we're experimenting a little bit whether we need to to tweak uh, the chemo to help there. So I have I have an off cycle right now, which you know it, it's great, you know because. Nobody loves to go in, you know, for chemo. But on the other positive side is on Tuesday, which would be the 27th as as we record this, uh, I get another CAT scan. And so that is going to assess whether there's been uh, improvement, whether essentially the chemo is doing what everybody hopes it'll do, uh, shrinking the mass, you know, in, in preparation for surgery. And then on November 2nd, I have my first surgical consult. Uh, so the surgeon will have the, the two scans to do the before and after comparison. And we'll, we'll just, you know, we'll take it from there. I mean, nobody knows what to predict. Nobody is predicting anything because they, they figured the normal 
pace is four to six chemo cycles, and then you start talking about surgery if it's you know if, if the chemo is doing what it's supposed to do. But you know the oncologist said you could walk in there and you could say, oh, it looks like you're ready for surgery tomorrow. Let's do that. You know, it, so there's really no predictability uh, to it. Obviously, we've had lots of people you know praying, uh, you know, for for me and just the specifics of it. And now you know now now part of me uh, is really I'm 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 really hoping that uh, the we'll see something dramatic uh, on the CAT scan. That would be nice. I mean, again, we 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 trust the Lord and His sovereignty uh, as always, but it'd be nice to see that specifically because, and I'll, I'll let my my praying public in on this. For some reason, I don't know what it was. The oncologist, you know, made a point of of telling me now, you know, it's not my chemotherapy that can take this away. We, you know, we're working towards surgery. Like I already know that. But he he just I don't know he just seemed to, to think that I didn't know that or whatever. So I'd love to go in there and have the thing gone, and and say, well, guess what? You just told me it wasn't anything you did. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> guess what? I know something you don't. <laughs> yeah. So that and that can that'd be a wonderful conversation to have. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're praying for that. Two yeah. big dates coming up. So everybody keep praying. Yep. That'd be awesome. We're going to turn this uh, podcast yep, into a so medical show, right. Mike. I mean, we got. Yeah, I know. I mean. Well, I, I thought about, you know, like like maybe some surgical wear with the Naked Bible logo yeah, on it. You know, yeah, some right, medical right. swag. Yeah. You know. <laughs> we should see. Pretend you're, you're for the kids. Pretend you're a doctor with this Naked yeah. Bible swag. Yeah. I think that's the first swag idea you didn't like, Trey. But this well, is yeah, why they didn't, they didn't work in marketing. Yeah, well, that's a downer. Nobody wants uh, downer. <laughs> some health naked Bible swag, that's for sure. But uh, maybe we can. I don't know. We'll 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 think of something. Yeah. But uh, is this you know, the podcast that makes you sick, mommy? You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's going to be a uh, hopefully a podcast of miracles. You know, sooner rather than later. So, yeah. And, uh, Wouldn't that be awesome? It'd be great. Well, Mike, this has so been a. We are we are on the, yeah, right. we're we're on the cusp here of finishing Revelation. Yeah, I mean, you, people probably didn't think we were going to get to it, but here we are. You know, right. we're <laughs> we're on the cusp. But we are you know, we are, yeah, we are bound and determined to finish Revelation. You know, before it finishes us or finishes exactly. Me. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, this is a this is a good day. We're going to do two parts here in part one. Um, so I'm excited yeah, to wrap but, up Revelation because I want to know how this all ends, Mike. You know, it means a lot to me and you. Well, it's, you know, there, there's just a ton of stuff, you know, in, in these last two chapters and by way of the Old Testament, which, of course, you know, if I, if I have to remind you of what we're doing thematically here at this point when we're at the end of the book, well, you know, that's, that, that's pitiful in a way. But I'm going to do it anyway. You know, our, our thing is the old use of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. And there's so much in these two chapters that we are going to split. We're going to combine the chapters, but split it into two parts. In this episode today, I'm going to, I'm going to more or less just take a general look at how the Old Testament sort of sets the table for these last two chapters. What I mean by that is there would be some that, you know, you, you either look at the chapters and you think, well, this is kind of weird stuff, you know, that like in the in the in the new Jerusalem, there's no temple. Like what happened to the temple? You know, because there's all this emphasis on on building a third temple. And as I've told people before who um are of the persuasion to expect that if a if a new temple got built in Jerusalem, it's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. I I personally don't think that. But if if you have someone who does, well, then what what happens to that temple? Because the temple gets rebuilt, there's Armageddon, and now all of a sudden in the new city, there is no temple. I mean, Revelation 21, 22 says that point blank. There's no, there's no temple. So this is one of the reasons why so many scholars have opted for a symbolic interpretation. And, and there'll be a lot of people in the audience who th- sort of think that that's cheating, you know, and they don't like the idea of not looking forward to a, a third temple. And by the way, just because it's not a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, in, in, in my view, doesn't mean it couldn't happen. I mean, it very well could for political reasons or religious reasons, whatever, in the Jewish community over there. But um, I think it's, it's a mistake to view that as a fulfillment of any particular prophecy. 
but it, you know, it, it still could happen for other reasons. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to it, but a lot of people who, who run into other believers that are not looking for this tend to think, well, you just want to, you just want to spiritualize revelation. You want to make it go away. You know, you must be a millennialist or, you know, whatever those sorts of things. Well, actually what I want to do in this episode is show how in the old Testament, you know, that's the three quarters and, and really the 90%, uh, if we include the new Testament, other than the book of revelation, you have 90% of your Bible does not point to a literal temple <laughs> At, at the end. And the Old Testament does not either. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the prophets in sort of a broad strokes and how the prophets will take an Old Testament new temple expectation, because that's certainly true. If you were an Israelite, especially if you're living in, in the days leading up to and, of course, after the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, you are thinking that God is not going to abandon us and, and we're going to have our temple back. There's going to, it's going to be rebuilt. You are certainly thinking that. But at the same time that the Old Testament lays that out there, it will conflate the idea of a new temple with, believe it or not, a new Jerusalem and a new earth. It does exactly what Revelation 21 and 22 does. And so if you're going to accuse the book of Revelation or someone interpreting the book of Revelation of being anti-literal or spiritualizing the temple stuff, well, I'm sorry, you got to do the same thing to your Old Testament. And we're going we're gonna to look at, again, in broad strokes, how the prophets do this, how they combine these ideas so that when we get to Revelation 21 and 22, it's stuff we've already seen before. That, that Jewish readers would have been expecting this as well. It wouldn't have come as a shock. What happened to that third temple we all wanted? Well, you know, if you had people who knew the scriptures, they would say, well, you know, there's this passage in Ezekiel or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Zechariah, all of them frankly do it, where we have the this hope for a new temple cast in terms of a new city and a new creation. And lo and behold, that's what we get in the end, in the book of Revelation. So I want to go through that material. Then next time, part two, we'll be going through chapters 21 and 22 with an eye toward very specific items that, you know, it's kind of in the after the pattern we've been wanting to do up to this point. But we'll look at very specific items in their Old Testament connections. So as we proceed, I think, again, it, it's going to be helpful in grasping the larger idea of temple. What What's I mean, everybody knew what a temple was. It's a place you, you go to worship, you go, you bring sacrifice, so on and so forth. But there's there's a larger concept in Old Testament theology of temple. It's not just a place where you bring sacrifices. It, it means more than that. And I'm going to refer here to a dissertation that has since been published, and you can get it. It's not frightfully expensive. But if you have access to uh, like the ProQuest dissertation database, you could get this for free in PDF. The uh, and I think I think even online, if you if you Google the name and the title, uh, the University of Saint Andrews might have an archive of their own for this dissertation that you could get it for free. But the author's name is Pilchan Lee. That's P I L C H A N. Last name is L E E. So Pilchan Lee, and it's entitled "The New Jerusalem in the Book of Revelation." Subtitle. A Study of Revelation 21 and 22 in Light of Its Background in Jewish Tradition. And this is a 1999 dissertation uh, done by uh, Dr. Lee at the University of St. Andrews uh, over in the UK. So I want to sort of track through a few specific points that he spends lots and lots of time, devotes a lot of word count and space to each one of these. But he looks at Ezekiel. Really, the whole book uh, gives us what I would call temple consciousness, the, the concept of a temple. It's, it, again, it's more than just a building or a place that you brought sacrifice. And then Isaiah 65 and 66 are really important. Jeremiah 30 and 31 are really important. And then Zechariah, again, the whole book, but I'll just pluck out a few chapters where, again, the, the concept of a temple, what it, what it means. What would an Israelite have thought of if you were playing, I don't know, you know, some kind of word game or Pictionary or whatever? I mean, there are lots of images 
lots of thoughts and concepts that are wrapped up and tied to and that accrue to the word temple. Again, it's more than a building. So we're not going to obviously be able to devote the kind of space that Lee does in his dissertation, but just going to track through here and give you some examples of what we're thinking about. And I think you'll see pretty quickly how this sets up Revelation 21 and 22. So if we look at Ezekiel, let's just start with Ezekiel. The book opens, as we know, because we did a whole series on Ezekiel. The book opens with the throne of God descending to the earth. This is Ezekiel's you know, weird wheels vision. And we know it's the throne of God because that's what the account tells us, you know, that there's a divine man, you know, God in human form seated on a throne. Throne has wheels. There's a throne platform. I mean, it's very clear this is the throne of God descending to earth. And it's a vision of global sovereignty by virtue of the four faces of the cherubim. We've talked about this in Revelation 4 and 5 in our episodes there. And also, of course, our own episodes in Ezekiel in chapter 1 back in, in the Ezekiel series. The four faces of the cherubim are the cardinal points of the Babylonian zodiac. That is not a mistake. It's, it's deliberate. It's intentional. Ezekiel is using imagery that would be familiar not only to the captives in Babylon, but to Babylonians as well. We have a vision here of the four far cardinal faces of the cherubim, points of the zodiac, and the messaging is obvious. God rules from his temple and his temple is descending. The messaging is he is still in control, even though he has allowed his people to be sent into exile for their idolatry. That doesn't mean he is beaten. It doesn't mean his program is beaten. God's program is not going to be thwarted even by the disobedience of his own people. He is still in control. So the fact that his throne is portrayed in this manner, where you have the four corners of the earth accounted for, means that the scope of his rule is the entire earth and all the nations, not just you know Israel, but all the nations. The heavenly temple, again, is the focus because the earthly temple is about to be destroyed. We learn that in the book of Ezekiel. So when the captives hear this news, the intention is for them to remember God is still on the throne. We saw this as Ezekiel began his ministry in, the, in this vision that he related to us via his preaching. When you get to Ezekiel 2, we have the glory departing. Of course, it departs in stages that runs through a number of chapters, you know, after you know, chapter 2 and beyond. And I want to read a little bit of what Lee says in his dissertation on page 3. He writes, following the description of the heavenly things, again, the cherubim specifically in the, the throne, Accusations about the rebelliousness of the people of Israel and predictions of judgment against the rebelliousness are narrated in Ezekiel chapters 2 through 8. This serves to justify God's action of the withdrawal of his glory from the Jerusalem temple and Jerusalem itself in chapters 9 through 11. The process of the withdrawal is gradually carried out through three steps. The first step of the withdrawal of the glory occurs in chapter 9 verse 3. This text shows that when the glory of God moved from the cherub in the temple to the threshold of the temple, God executed his judgment against the rebellious people through the agent who is called, quote, the man in linen. God also protected the godly people by placing a mark on their foreheads of those who were sighing and groaning over all the abominations that were committed in Ezekiel 9.4. Let me just stop there. We've had this imagery directly from, from Ezekiel 9 in the book of Revelation with the mark put upon the 144,000. This is drawn directly from the same you know, chapter here in, in, in Ezekiel. Back to Lee, he says, this immediate action of the man in linen, you know, putting the mark on the foreheads of the godly, indicates that the removal of God's glory from the temple necessitated the judgment against Israel. Everyone who doesn't have the mark is going to be judged. And this is outlined in Ezekiel 10, 2 through 9. In Ezekiel 10, 18 through 19, the process of the removal is once again advanced. In particular, the phrase, quote, the cherubim rose up from the earth, unquote, in Ezekiel 10, 19, clearly represents the departure of the glory of God from the earthly temple. At last, the cherubim stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the house, and the glory of the God of Israel was there also. Ezekiel 11, 
22 and 23 demonstrates the final stage of the process of removal. The foregoing text shows that the glory of God is not completely removed from the city of Jerusalem, but only from the earthly Jerusalem temple. The glory remains on the mountain east of the city, and this position leaves open the possibility of restoration, as well as judgment against the rebellious people. These twin aspects establish a pattern for the following chapters until the full detail of the restoration is given in chapters 36 through 48. That's the big temple description in the book. In Ezekiel 11, 17 through 20, the promises of restoration are provided as follows. Now, listen to the list that you actually get in Ezekiel 11 about the restoration of God's presence in the city and, of course, you know, at this point in the, in the temple, the temple expectation. Number one, there is a returning or gathering from exile to the land of Israel. That's Ezekiel 11, 17. Two, there's a removal of the detestable heart and endowment of a new heart and a new spirit within them. That's 11, 18 through 20. It's the new covenant. Three, renewal of the old covenant. That's 11, 20, B, second half of verse 20. And therefore, to conclude from those three things, God being the temple for Israel in the exile promotes a sense of expectation for restoration. Now, what, what does he mean by that? What is, that's the end of the Lee quote. If you look at those things, you have a return of the you know, Israelites, the Judeans, to the land of Israel. We have a new covenant, a new heart given to those people and a new spirit within them. And then we have a renewal of the relationship between God and his people. Again, just the, the, the covenantal relationship that you know, we would expect to be there since the times of Abraham and Moses. All three of those things happen in the New Testament. They precede the second coming. We have you know, in Pentecost the fulfillment of this regathering. We have, we have the Spirit coming. Again, the new covenant is fulfilled at Pentecost. You know, the, the, the family of God is essentially reborn, and now it's, it's renewed that, yes, there's, there, there's a covenantal idea that has always existed all the way back again, Abraham and Moses. But this new covenant is going to include new people, the Gentiles. Okay, so we've had all these things, and they're easy to detect in the New Testament, but they're all precursors to this, this idea of, of getting this new temple, getting the, the very presence of God, you know, back on earth and you know, a, a new city, because the city was destroyed too by the Babylonians. It's not just the temple, it's all Jerusalem. So the expectation is to have a, a new Jerusalem that's as good or better than the old, a new temple. And all these things in, in the prophecy of Ezekiel precede that. Okay. Now Lee goes on to outline a series of events in his dissertation. He goes through Ezekiel 12 through 35. And he goes through a whole series of these, and this is the part where I, we, we just can't reproduce this in a podcast. There's you know, a dozen of them that demonstrate the opportunity for an expectation of restoration of the people of God and a new city, a new temple, all this. Now, the first of those is the establishment of an everlasting covenant by remembrance and renewal of God's covenant with Israel in the past. We get some of that in Ezekiel 16. Then there's the gathering of the people that he was referred to in chapter 11. It gets referred to again in Ezekiel 20. Third example, there's a prophecy of peaceful, safe, and bountiful life upon their return to Jerusalem from exile. The, the, the returning captives have safety in life. They build houses. They plant vineyards. This is Ezekiel 28, 25 through 26. The fourth is a prophesied new creation itself, cast in Edenic terms. And here I'm going to quote, from Lee's summary. He says, especially this, this third and fourth uh, illustration of the events of Ezekiel 12, 35, 12, excuse me, yeah, Ezekiel chapter 12 through chapter 35. He summarizes this way. We read about the banishment of wild animals from the land. We read about sending of seasoning showers as God's blessing, the trees yielding fruits and the productiveness of the land the acknowledgement of God. There's no more plunder for the nations. There's no more animals of the land to devour people. They live in safety. There's plenty of provision of splendid vegetation with no more hunger in the land. 
There's an end to suffering from the insults of the nations. Israel belongs again to God as his sheep in his pasture. And that really derives from Ezekiel 34, 25 through 30. It sounds a lot like Eden, doesn't it? It's supposed to, because this ultimately is where everything is headed back toward. So we have prophecies of the new covenant, national resurrection, national restoration, an an Edenic set of circumstances in the land. This is, you know, Ezekiel 12 through 35. And when you hit Ezekiel 36, then the, the national resurrection idea gets really ramped up. Ezekiel 37 is the dry bones. I mean, all these chapters we've done episodes on, specifically episodes 150 through 157, 341, 342, and then 391 and 392 to loop in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, for our purposes here today, there are several points to be made from all of this as it pertains to the book of Ezekiel. What what Lee is trying to to embed in our consciousness about how Israelites, especially those coming out of exile or expecting to come out of exile, would have thought about temple. First, there's a restoration of a new Jerusalem with a temple that was that was certainly expected by Israelites. So they anticipate getting back what was lost. Second, this new Jerusalem, strangely enough, gets cast in restored Edenic terms. So rather than specifically talking about a building or, or any one element of, of a city, the whole land is in view. And again, you get, you get this Edenic description about no more hunger, no more disease, there's always enough to eat, always enough rain. The, even the even the animals that would kill us, you know, aren't gonna, aren't going to kill us anymore. You know, there's no nations around us to threaten us. You know, if we if they rebuild a, a temple today in Jerusalem, there are plenty of nations around them that would still want to threaten Israel. In fact, that the you know the circumstances of a third temple would make it worse. Okay, so it, it doesn't really conform to what Ezekiel is is talking about here. The, the end, the new city, the new Jerusalem, the new, the new Eden, the new, the new earth, it certainly fits the description. So but all the way back in the Old Testament, you get this Edenic feel for what's going on. Third, since the new temple in New Jerusalem was essentially recast as a new Edenic earth in the Old Testament, this sets the stage for Revelation 21, which opens precisely that way. It describes a city, the New Jerusalem, as the heart of a new creation, and that city actually lacks a temple. I'm going to read Revelation 21, the first three verses, and then I'm going to skip to verse 22. So if we actually look at what Revelation 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, this is right after what? It's right after the second coming. It's right after chaos has been dealt with in the lake of fire. We talked about these things in two installments with Revelation 19. It's it's after all these things, the demise of Antichrist and whatnot. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Again, it's a it's probably my favorite verse in the New Testament. See, is a chaos image. There's no more chaos. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Now, let me just stop there. He's not describing a new temple. He's describing a new city, Jerusalem. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And you go down to verse 22, and John is very clear. I saw, he, he describes the city with the streets, you know, gold like clear glass and all these different gemstones, all the imagery of the city and its its 
splendor, the spectacular nature of it. And then he hits verse 22 and says, and I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. That's the temple. God himself, and of course the Lamb, who is the risen Christ. There's no building there. It, it's them. Okay? So I think it's it's important to just hear what Revelation 21, how it starts out, that there is no no temple. And we would think it's odd. Why are you fixated on describing the city, John? What's all this new earth Edenic stuff going? You know, what a what about this? What about the new temple? The temple is God. The temple is is the returned Christ. You know, I, I hate to use this this language, but it looks like John spiritualizes the temple. <laughs> you know, and, and and according to some, that that's what he's doing because he's not talking about building a structure. He's not talking about a structure at all. He's talking about the body of Christ. Christ Himself is the temple. God and Christ are the temple. So right away, you know, it, it takes you into this mode. And this is the point of our episode today. That's not at odds with the Old Testament. It's actually in concert with it. Because the Old Testament will take expectations of a new temple and it will conflate them with the vision of a new city and a new earth. It's exactly what Revelation 21 and 22 does. Now, if you recall our earlier podcasts on Revelation 19, we did two parts. In Revelation 16 through 19, you have this cycle of the end of chaos, the return of Jesus, the consummation of the new earth. And we, we went, we've spent a lot of time going over that ground. Did you notice none of it involved building a new structure in Jerusalem? None of it involved building a temple, either before or after those events. And now that we're after Revelation 21, 22, it still doesn't. Recall as well that New Testament temple talk, okay, and how the new, when I say temple talk, I mean how the New Testament uses temple to talk not about a building, but about something else, namely the body of Christ. And this begins in John chapter 2, who, incidentally, written by John, this is the John that most scholars would argue is the same author as the book of Revelation. So, John if that's the case, and that you can certainly build a really good case for that. When John thinks temple, yes, he knows about the literal temple. He's a Jew. He grew up, you know, in Jerusalem. He knows all that. But his his concept of temple is so much bigger. And in John chapter 2, this is the passage where he gets in, Jesus gets in trouble with the Pharisees when he says, you know, destroy this temple, and in three days, you know, I'm going to, you know, it'll be restored. And the Pharisees are like, what's this dude talking about? It took over 40 years to build this thing. And he's talking about he can rebuild it in three days. And John tells us he wasn't speaking about the literal temple. He was speaking about his body. The body of Christ is the temple in John chapter 2. Again, this is an Old Testament thought. It's not just something John's making up because he needs to finish the second chapter and doesn't know how. And Peter and Paul follow John in this thinking, in their own description of believers, the body of Christ. Believers, they're the body of Christ. They are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6. You know, you have the description in Peter about the believers being living stones, you know, and Christ the cornerstone of the temple. You know, this language is deliberate. It's, it's, it's about the return Christ. It's about the body of Christ. We who are him, we, you know, He gets the promises of of messianic rule in the new earth, and guess what? So do we. He hands them to us. He shares them because we are his body. To him that overcomes, I will set him over the nations. Again, he will sit with me on my throne to rule. So Revelation 21 and 22 does not come out of the blue. Its elements, the way it, it understands temple, is not lacking precedent. The precedent is the Old Testament. And, you know, if we want to loop the New Testament in there too other parts of it. Now let's go to Isaiah 65 and 66. You get more of this from Isaiah. So that was Ezekiel. Again, how it's leading, this temple talk is leading to, you know, something much bigger. And if you're wondering about you know, the, the temple vision, Ezekiel 40 through 48, again, we did a whole series um, on Ezekiel 
I recommend listening to the last two episodes of the book. Ezekiel 40 through 48, we devoted two episodes to that. First one, we, we said, if this is a literal temple, you know, how do we read this and are there any problems? And yeah, there are. And then the second part is, well, is there any indication this might not be best understood literally? And there, there's, there's some crazy stuff that if you're not used to thinking in this mode, it's some amazing stuff from, from both the Old Testament and the New Testament that should influence our temple thinking. But let's go to Isaiah 65 and 66, and Lee on page 12 writes this. He says, The book of Isaiah is full of restorational messages. They are largely but conclusively confined to chapters 40 through 66. And among chapters 40 through 66, Isaiah 65, 16 through 25, is the most systematized passage about the restoration of the New Jerusalem. In this respect, this study his own study, and of course his book, if you choose to buy it, aims first to provide a thorough exegesis of that passage. So he spends a lot of time on Isaiah 65 and on into Isaiah 66, and that alone is worth the price of the book, because it, this, this passage is so key. He says the motifs in Isaiah 65, verses 16 through 25, appear to be similar to those in Isaiah 66, the first 24 verses. And if you look at that, Lee says, if you look at the similarities between what is said in chapter 65 to what's in chapter 66, when you do that, you'll see that the latter, Isaiah 66, complements with an E. It, it, it dovetails. It supplements chapter 65. Isaiah 65 is divided into two parts. And here they are, the new creation and the new Jerusalem, and the life in the new Jerusalem and the new creation. So what, what, what's interesting is that when Isaiah begins to allude to getting the temple back, he talks about that idea in connection with the new creation and the new Jerusalem, just like Revelation 21 and 22 does. And I hope you're, I hope you're, you're what, what's ringing around in your head is, well, you know, isn't it logical to assume that John, when he wrote Revelation 21 and 22, used and repurposed Ezekiel and Isaiah 65 and 66 to, to say what he wanted to say? And the, the answer to that is, of course, sure. That's exactly what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to get you to see. The descriptions there are not random. They come out of the Old Testament. It's not just sort of wishful thinking on the part of an amillennialist or something like that. This is Old Testament. And they, you know, a, lot, a lot of us typically neglect this, this stuff, but it's there. Now let's look at Isaiah 65, and I'm going to read 16, the verses 16 through 18 to you. It's, it's already going to sound like Revelation 21 because I just read, you know, first few verses in Revelation 21, but here we go with Isaiah 65, 16 and 18. So that he, he who blesses himself in the land, now they're, you know, they're, they're going back to the land here, shall bless himself by the God of truth, and he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. And this is the Lord speaking. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. In fact, it is Isaiah 65, 17 that John quotes in Revelation 21 about the former things not being remembered or coming to mind. He quotes this, this verse. Now, if, if you look at the, the two verses here, verses 16 and 17, they parallel each other. And Lee writes, both 16 and 17 emphasize the removal of the memory of the former troubles. Remember verse 16, the former troubles are forgotten, they are hidden from my eyes, you know, says the Lord. So verse 16 emphasizes the removal of the memory of the former troubles. And verse 17 says the same thing, the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Now, in Isaiah's context, this is the Babylonian exile. This is the terrible thing that's going to happen to the people of God. They're going to be 
judged, forsaken uh, by God, not forever, again, because there is restoration planned. But this is their punishment for idolatry. They're going to go into exile in Babylon, in, into the domain of chaos, right into the heart of the lion, the heart of chaos. Now, Lee comments, he says, the structure of the two verses shows that the new creation in verse 17, remember Isaiah said, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The new creation in 17 and the new Jerusalem in verse 18, for behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, are given as the compensation for the past shameful history, namely the Babylonian exile. In other words, the solution of the exile is not building a third temple, literal temple. The solution of the exile ultimately is a new city and a new earth. The new creation and the new Jerusalem are so powerfully introduced to the Israelites that they may be able to erase the period of Babylonian exile. Moreover, verse 18 illustrates God's creative work spoken of the new Jerusalem in that verse, as well as the new creation in verse 17. In this case, the summons to joyfulness in verse 18 stresses the greatness of the new Jerusalem by its insertion just before the reference you know, to that you know, in the actual passage. Now, Lee goes on in, what, in his dissertation, he, he, goes, he goes on in regard to how the New Jerusalem is closely related with the new creation. And he writes this, The restoration of Jerusalem entails the restoration of creation, just as Isaiah 65, 19 through 25 will show below. Let me just stop there with that first sentence. Do you realize that there are a number of passages in the prophets that link the restoration of Jerusalem to the restoration of creation itself. So that what that means in practical terms is if you build a third temple today, and let's say you cleaned up Jerusalem, you got rid of all the terrorists, you had no crime, you know, you had this wonderful society where people are dwelling in peace. I mean, none of this would happen if we built a third temple today anyway, because again, it would infuriate Israel's enemies. But Let's just say it did. What's supposed to happen along with it is the new earth, the new creation. Those things go hand in hand in the Old Testament. And I, I, I have yet to come across someone who really enjoys, and you know, it's, it's not a crime, it's not a sin. They, they enjoy the idea of Israel getting a third temple. It would be cool. And you know, I'll, I'll admit it would be cool. You know, I, I'd hold my breath again because of the enemies around her, but I have yet to come across anybody who really is into this idea of a third temple mention that, oh, and, and when this happens, then we get the new Eden, we get the new creation, which of course involves the destruction of the old one. <laughs> it, it, what, I'm getting, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is everybody seems, you know, again, there are a lot of people who look for the former, but they forget the latter because they don't know their Old Testament well. They only see part of it. You can't talk about a restored Jerusalem without talking about the restoration of creation, unless you just don't mention the prophets. Well, good luck with that. That would really be cheating on a, on a grand scale, to be honest with you. These two things go hand in hand in the prophet's mind. So back to Lee, he says, generally speaking, Jerusalem or Zion is the center of God's rule in the history of Israel. He cites Jeremiah 3.17, Ezekiel 5.5. 5. While God rules the whole universe, he focuses his rule on the nation Israel. While he rules the whole land of Israel, he reveals his ruling power through the city, Jerusalem. Therefore, Jerusalem is the place which illustrates the fact that God rules the whole universe. Okay. People see God's glory through the city. Therefore, it is possible to say that the new Jerusalem is the center of the new creation. It certainly is in the book of Revelation. In the new creation, Lee says, the new Jerusalem is the place which reveals God's sovereignty more gloriously than any place else, though the new creation itself also reveals it. Therefore, without the new Jerusalem, the new creation is meaningless. Accordingly, the restoration of Jerusalem results in the restoration of God's sovereignty, and the restoration of God's sovereignty results in the restoration of creation. 
you know, pardon me if I dip back into Revelation 19 a little bit, but can we see now why Armageddon is not about the plains of Megiddo? Again, there's no mountain there anyway. It's about Jerusalem. It's about Zion. Jerusalem is the linchpin to, to all of it. And by the way, an amillennialist wouldn't say that. I would, because I'm not an amillennialist. Again, we talked about this in Revelation 19 as well. I don't, it doesn't bother me in the least that I don't fit the, the typical nomenclature. Oh, well. Okay, these things are in the text, and it's up to us to, to try to figure out how to understand, how to connect the dots that are in the text. Now, not surprisingly, Beale and McDonough in their Revelation, specifically it's the, the Old Testament in the New Testament commentary edited by Beale and Carson, which we have used throughout this series. So it's a great tool. But Beale and McDonough, who wrote the chapter on Revelation, they pick up on this trajectory, this linkage, and they write this. The new cosmos will be an identifiable counterpart to the old cosmos and a renewal of it, just as the body will be raised without losing its former identity. The qualitative antithesis between the first world and the second one is highlighted by Isaiah 65, 17 and Isaiah 66, 22. Let me just read both of those. Isaiah 65, 17, we'll read them in tandem here. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. And now Isaiah 66, 22, scroll down here and read that says, For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. Then verse 23 will throw in, From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. I mean, this, these two things go together. The qualitative, like they say, like Beale and McDonald say, the qualitative antithesis between the first world and the second one is highlighted by these two verses, which stand behind the wording of Revelation 21, 1, which dips into Isaiah 65, 17 in the Septuagint. For there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. They will by no means remember the former. And if the one is going to endure, like Isaiah 66, 22 says, well, so is the other one, because they're linked. Back to Beale and McDonough, they say Isaiah 65, 16 through 18 makes a qualitative contrast between the former earth, where the first affliction of captivity occurred, and a new heaven and a new earth where there will be only enduring joy and exaltation. Isaiah 66, 22 affirms that one of the qualitative differences is that the new heaven and new earth will remain forever, in contrast to the old which passed away. Revelation 21.1 portrays the future fulfillment of the two Isaiahic new creation prophecies. Judaism, more widely, Second Temple Judaism, also conceived of the new creation as a renewal or renovation of the old. And he cites a bunch of passages here from Jubilees 1 and 4, 1 Enoch 45, 2 Baruch 32, so on and so forth. I mean, these ideas are linked together. And, and we when we try to interpret these things, we, we, need to, we need to honor the linkage. We need to not put asunder what God has joined together, you know, in, in the text. Now, one last thought, or one last thought before going to Jeremiah, as we have Jeremiah and Zechariah to pick up yet. Scholars have noticed that the blessings or conditions described for the new Jerusalem and new creation are the reverse of the covenantal curses found in Deuteronomy 28. Remember Deuteronomy 28 and 29, these are the blessings and the cursings, the cursings and the blessings um, that have to do with remaining in the land or being expelled from it. So uh, Pilchon Lee in his dissertation writes this, he says, In the New Jerusalem, nature will be restored into the original peaceful condition of the Garden of Eden, where wild animals will not prey on the domestic animals. He, he has a reference here to 4320, Isaiah 4320. This peace in the animal world provides safety and security for people in the New Jerusalem. This is also the reversal of the covenantal curses in Deuteronomy 28, 26. And he has another cross-reference here to Isaiah 13, 20 through 21. So scholars have noticed this, that 
all these blessings that are summarized in these Isaiah passages with the new Jerusalem and the new heaven, they reverse the expulsion curses in Deuteronomy 28. Now that reversal linkage, here's why I bring it up, is another sign that the circumcision neutral body of Christ is a new Israel. Again, it's not the new Israel. I'm not a, I'm not a supersessionist, but it is the body of Christ is a new Israel that we have this, we have, we have a circumstance that plays itself out in the church. Okay. Where you've, you've got, we're in revelation 21 and 20, 22. Now folks, we're dealing with Gentiles in the church. We're in a book, the book of revelation that has called Gentiles, a kingdom of priests you know, along with the Jews. We've seen plenty of, of places where the people of God, there's only one people of God. It has a Jewish component, it has a Gentile component, but there's one people of God. And the fact that, that the curse is put on the original people of God, the Jew, who went into exile because of their idolatry, are reversed by the circumstances of the new people of God that includes Gentiles is interesting, to say the least. Isaiah 66, again, ends with Gentiles being grafted into the family and worshiping the Lord at Jerusalem. It's just another trajectory that shows the unity of the people of God. It's tied up with what the New Jerusalem is. There are no insiders and outsiders. There are only insiders. And, of course, the New Earth. We go back to Eden, before there was such a thing as a Jew and a Gentile. There is one people of God. That's the way it started at the beginning. This is the way it's going to end, because God will run everything full circle. There will be no more nations to plague you know, the people of God as a nation. Those who survive among the nations are believers. They follow the risen Christ. They follow the gospel. They are happy to be part of a new Jerusalem and God doing something new with the old. Again, and all of it, again, focuses on Zion and Jerusalem. The city, the city and the land are linked to a new creation itself. I mean, all these things are, again, interrelated. But none of this is literal temple talk. This is what I'm hoping that, that, that you see as we go into Revelation 21, 22 in, the, in part two. You know, it, it, the, the lang re restricting the language to the, the Old Testament and New Testament temple language to one building in one place diminishes the the impact of, of, of all the of all the concepts that the temple embraces. Now it should also be noted that at various places in Isaiah leading up to chapter 65 and 66, Isaiah contains passages that, like Ezekiel, lead the reader to expect the rebuilding of a lost temple. So there is this expectation. Again, we're not denying it. But what we miss is that there are certain passages that while they have this expectation, they do something different with it than you know you and I would perhaps expect. Let's look at Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28 is one of these passages about expecting you know this the new temple, okay? So let's read Isaiah 28. I'm going to go back to verse 14 here. We'll read 14 through 18. But the verse that we want to focus on is verse 16. So listen to this. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. Boy, isn't that just a cutting remark? <laughs> he calls the Jerusalem leaders scoffers. Oh, anyway, I, I, just, I just love stuff like that. I, I, love, I love digs like that. But anyway, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through it, through it, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. What he's alluding to here basically is is the is the BS that the Jerusalem leadership had been telling the people. Oh, you know, yeah, things are bad. We have enemies, and the enemies are going to come, and we're going to have war, and but we'll be okay. We'll be okay. The Lord's with us all the all the while being idolaters. They, 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 they're living out the lies they tell, okay? And God knows it. So, and what they've actually done is make a covenant with death. 
Therefore, verse 16, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm the one who has laid, who has laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and the righteous and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. So you've, you've, you've made your, you know, you've, you've aligned yourself with other gods gods who, who can't promise you anything, certainly life. Gods have lied to you and you've just bought their lies and now perpetuate their lives and their lies and live them out. The end thereof are the ways of death, because only with Yahweh is, this, is, is their life, this whole idea. And, and the Lord's saying, it's not going to work. You know, when, when it hits the fan, you know, your, your covenant with these other gods, it's over. You're not, it's not going to stand and you're going to get overwhelmed. And look at what he says in the, in the middle of this. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone. I've laid a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And then he talks about justice and righteousness. Now, that passage, I'm sure, sounds familiar. I lay in Zion as a stone, a chief cornerstone. So let's ask ourselves the question, how does Isaiah 28, 16 get fulfilled? Because you would think if you're reading Isaiah 28, and especially if you're an Israelite in hindsight after the temple has been destroyed, let's say you're living in the second temple period, and you read this, and you, 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 you know, you're naturally going to think, wow, you know, the, the, Lord, the Lord isn't going to forsake us entirely. He, he's got a, a foundation, cornerstone laid there. In other words, he's going to finish what he started there. We're going to get the temple back. We're going to get the. We're going to get it back. The Lord has not forgotten us. I mean, this is a natural way to look at it. But the question is, how does it actually get fulfilled? Was the third temple built and Israel's covenant with death, you know, the exile resolved? No. So we, we, we can't look at anything prior to the New Testament like that. But when we look at the New Testament, where is where is this verse actually cited? Let's go to Matthew twenty one forty two. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So what's the stone he's talking about? He, he, he says that, he quotes that verse right after the parable of the tenants. You know, there's a master in the house who planted a vineyard, okay, and you know, when the season for its fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get its fruit. And the, and the tenants watching over the, the field, who would be the leadership in Jerusalem, if we take it back to Isaiah, they, re, they reject. They reject you know, his servants. They beat, one, they beat them and kill them, and they stone them. And, it, and then you know, the, they reason among themselves, well, surely he won't do that if we send you know, his son. They'll respect my son, you know, the the owner, the master of the house thinks, they'll respect my son. He sends his son, they kill him too. So the son, and of course, Jesus in context, is this cornerstone. Now think about that. If you're a Jew and you know Isaiah 28, and you've been thinking all along that this means we're going to get the temple back, here's the question. Did you get the temple back? Be careful how you answer. You didn't get a literal building but you got the Messiah. He did come. He did die. He did rise again. He did ascend to the Father. He did everything that he was asked to do by the Father. Yeah, you got the Messiah. Have you rejected him? See, the Messiah turns out to be the cornerstone. It has nothing to do with a literal temple. In fact, here we go again. The temple turns out to be the body of Christ. Christ himself. He is the temple. So that's Matthew 21, 42. How about Acts 4, 11? This is the other place where the passage uh, is quoted, the Isaiah 28 passage. So we've got Acts 4, 11. 
and this is you know the the apostles preaching to the rulers to, to the rulers of the people and the elders to the perfect audience this is just after they've healed someone and the, of course the the leadership is is irate then peter this is verse 8 filled with the holy spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what by what means this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. And here, here's the verse. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, again, if you're a Second Temple Jew and you know Isaiah 28 and you're expecting a literal building to come out of that prophecy and you've heard about or maybe seen the events of Pentecost, you're living in Jerusalem where you see the, the, the followers of Jesus telling you that the new covenant has come. You've seen the gathering of, of people, of, of Jews from all over the, all over the world you know, for Pentecost. And, and, and how they go back believing and preaching about the Messiah, how that's going to be a reversal of Babel, Babylon, the whole exilic situation. And then you, you hear about this healing, or maybe you witness it. And then a lot these guys who, who just heal this man and who did what they did on the day of Pentecost where 3,000 people are, you know, believe and are saved, say, hey, you know that cornerstone passage back in Isaiah 28? And we were all kind of thinking at one point was about rebuilding a temple. By the way, they have a temple. <laughs> you know, the one that hasn't yet been destroyed by the Romans. Guess what? That's not really the temple. The, the chief cornerstone, the stone that Isaiah talked about, is Jesus. And this is what I mean by New Testament, and now we're finding out Old Testament temple consciousness. It's just a bigger concept than a building. So let's go to Jeremiah 30, 31 real quickly. Lee introduces the contribution of these two chapters and temple thinking this way. He says, Jeremiah lived during the period of upheaval in both northern Israel and southern Judah. Most of his message appears to contain judgment against sinful Israel. However, the messages of restoration are included with the dreadful judgment messages. It's a nice way of summarizing the whole book. Uh, Lee says, in other words, the messages of restoration are fragmentarily scattered throughout the book without an apparent coherent structure and presentation. And they're just sprinkled in there. Where the pronouncements of judgment are predominant, this location implies that God's judgment will eventually lead to restoration and guarantees to reverse the curses caused by God's judgment. However, these messages in the midst of dominantly judgmental oracles are only fully formalized in chapters 30 and 31, they're, they're kind of presented more formally there, which is the so-called Book of Consolation, and they are corroborated and supplemented by chapters 32 and 33. By the way, chapter 33 is the New Covenant. So let's look at Jeremiah 30, 1 through 3, and verses 8 through 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Now, think about two phrases. I'm going to bring them back, and they're going to take possession. Okay? Verse 8, And it shall come to pass, it will break his, again, the enemy, his joke from off your neck and I will burst your bonds and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up for them then fear not O Jacob my servant declares the Lord nor be dismayed O Israel for behold I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of captivity Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease and none shall make him afraid for I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. I will make a full end of all the nations among whom I scattered you. But of you, I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. But again, you're not going to be done away with permanently. 
Now look, look at what we've got here. We've got a reference to taking possession. We've got a couple of references to being brought back to the land. Of course, that's where they would take possession. And we have a reference to David the king. Now, possessing the land and taking up occupation suggests, it doesn't state, but it suggests the need for a new temple because you're going to have to worship somewhere. Release from the nations is also in, in this picture. In other words, there's, there's going to be no more nations to harass and bother you. And again, that, that smacks of a time when the nations are on your side. So we're getting a little, a little hint of sort of the kind of stuff we'd see in Isaiah 65 and 66. We have the judgment of chaos and restoration and a hint of being brought back into the land. And, and again, if we take possession of it, that, that requires a temple. Now in Jeremiah 30, a little later in verse 18, it says this, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt on its mound, and the palace shall stand where it used to be. Now this is clear. Now we're talking about a rebuilt city, and we're talking about a palace, which, which means you know the king's going to be there. Now nestled in a, a, a bunch of this stuff, or not not nestled in here, but but before you get here, you actually do get a more direct reference to the need for a temple in Jeremiah. And this is going to come as a surprise, a surprise unless you've watched my Fringe Pop episode on the Ark of the Covenant. You may never have seen this or heard this before. Along with this rebuilding of the new community in Jeremiah 30, because that's what we have, the new community, we have the king, the land, all this stuff. Jeremiah 3 is the other significant passage, for it morphs talk of the throne of the Lord. What do we usually think of when we think of the throne of the Lord? Well, we think of the cherubim, the, which makes us think of the ark. We, th we think of the ark because the ark was the Lord's seat, the so-called mercy seat. Later, it's going to be called the footstool. Again, if you've read Unseen Realm, you know why. But we, we usually think of the Ark of the Covenant. So Jeremiah 3 kind of morphs talk of the throne of the Lord into the New Jerusalem. Like, so it, it goes from talking about the Ark to the New Jerusalem. And, and so again, temple talk morphing into the whole city, which sounds like Revelation 21. Listen to Jeremiah 3. Again, you, you, you may never have heard this before. It says, Go. And proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt, that you rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree, and that you have not obeyed my voice, declares the Lord. Return, faithless children, declares the Lord. For I am your master. I will take you one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart. So that here we have this thing about a return, okay? And this time we're going to get new shepherds that are not idolaters. And this is a reference to apostles and, and you know, prophets and you know, people like this who are recognized Jesus as Messiah and so on and so forth. But I'm going to take you, one from a city and two from a family, and bring you to Zion. I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And when you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land in those days, declares the Lord, they shall no more say, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, quote unquote. It, the ark, shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. <laughs> this is Jeremiah 3 telling us that the Ark of the Covenant, yeah, it's, it's, it's gone. I mean, it's in, by the time you read the finished book of Jeremiah, it's going to be history because of Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. And again, you can watch my Fringe Pop episode or listen to the podcast episode we did on this, but it's missing. It's gone. And right here at Point Blank, it says, it shall not be made again. I would suggest to you that if the plan was to rebuild a new temple, literally a building, you're going to need an ark. But not only is it, is it not going to be built again, right from the mouth of Jeremiah, verse 17, at that time, Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord and all nations shall gather to it. It sounds to me like the city is the temple. And that sounds an awful lot like, yep, Revelation 21. 
So again, we have this expanded temple thinking that refers more to the returned Messiah and more to Zion, more to the city and, of course, the new creation than anything else. You know, viewed in its totality, this is even a denial that the Ark of the Covenant is going to be rebuilt. It doesn't say it'll be found either. Again, my, I think this is the clearest reference, and you, and you rarely ever find it mentioned in discussions about what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. It's, ex, it's exceedingly rare to find this reference because it basically says it's lost. We don't, you know, it, it got destroyed, or, you know, whoever, whatever. Regardless, it, it's lost and it won't be built again. You're not going to need it because you don't need the temple because the temple is the returning Lord. The temple is the glory returned to the city. Of course, we know in the form of the returned Christ at, at his coming, his second coming. That's where all this stuff points to. And it sounds a whole lot like Revelation 21. So again, this is what you get. And Zechariah, our last little portion here. Zechariah, most scholars divide Zechariah into two sections, chapters 1 through 9 and then 10 to 14. But there's a lot in the book about the exile and the restoration. And when, when you talk about exile and restoration, you're invariably talking about a new city and a new temple and people being regathered, all these things, you know, that we've seen in these other prophets. So I want to, I want to park on a few places in Zechariah because the whole book is full, filled with this stuff. Zechariah three, in that chapter, the nation is cleansed. Remember the vision of Joshua, the high priest. He has the filthy garments, which represent you know, the crimes and the sins of the, the nation. They, they, the filthy garments get taken away and they get changed into new garments. So in this, in this chapter, we have the nation cleansed and forgiven. The high priest is restored. You know, his garments are a big deal. He can't minister in a temple unless his clothing is pure, he, he's clean. So right, right away, we have, this, we have this sort of temple expectation again, because we have a priesthood expectation. This suggests a renewed priesthood, and you wouldn't renew the priesthood, you would think, unless you're going to have a, a new temple. So that, that's built in. Commenting on the priest's clothing of, his, of Exodus 28, this is where the, the priest's clothing originally is designed and, and created back in the book of Exodus. Lee writes this, Throughout the whole chapter in Exodus 28, the high priestly clothes are described as glorious and sacred by, by precious stones attached to the clothes, and the turban of the high priest, which is associated with an important function to, to remove the guilt, of the, guilt that the Israelites incurred in the holy offerings by a rosette of pure gold on the front of the turban in Exodus 28, 36-38. Accordingly, maintaining the sanctity of the high priest's garment and his turban as a part of the garment is important for carrying out the priestly duties and to remove the guilt of others. That's why you have a priesthood. Moving to Zechariah 4, the very next chapter, Lee writes this. So we've got the cleansing of Joshua the high priest and the garments. Then we hit chapter 4 and Lee writes, the rebuilding of the New Jerusalem or temple is also emphasized in the fifth vision. This is Zechariah 4, 1 through 14. So we, we get it alluded to in Zechariah 3 because of the priest and cleaning him up, and now we get it in this chapter. And Lee says, this happens through the encouragement of Zerubbabel. The hands of Zerubbabel have, this is, this is Zechariah 4, 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house. So Zerubbabel started rebuilding the temple. His hands shall also complete it. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Zechariah 4, 9. The work, though, what, what about this completion? Because they didn't really, did they really complete? You, know, you, you got to throw Haggai and, of course, Zechariah in there and, until you get the second temple. We, we get that, but, but look at what follows. Zechariah 4 says, The work will not be completed by his, Zerubbabel's might, nor by his power. And Zerubbabel is the David figure. He's, he's descended from David. But only by God's Spirit will this be accomplished in verse 6. Zechariah 4, 6, only by the Spirit of God will this temple be completed. The temple rebuilding is thus accomplished by divine power. On the one hand, a Davidic king, such as Zerubbabel, is assigned as the agent of the rebuilding of the new temple in Jerusalem. 
But on the other hand, and this is something, again, unless you were reading Zechariah really closely, you'd never see. On the other hand, Joshua, the high priest, is used to remove the guilt of Israel, which caused the destruction of the first Jerusalem and the first temple. Both figures appear to overlap in the person of Joshua because of the crowning of Joshua in Zechariah 6, 9 through 13. And did you catch that? You've got Zerubbabel, king figure, the David figure, and you've got Joshua, again, the high priest. Uh, if, if you're thinking back to David Mitchell's session on Messiah ben Joseph and the Joshua language, good for you, because this, this is part of it. But anyway, you, you've got two figures here, a priest figure and a king figure. But who gets crowned to complete this task in in Zechariah 6, 9 through 13? Let me read it to you. It's not Zerubbabel, which is the crazy thing. It's the priest. So Zechariah 6, 9 through 13 says this. The ESV has this section marked as the crown and the temple. The word of the Lord came to me, take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, he's speaking this to the to Joshua, the high priest, not to, not to Zerubbabel, who's descended from David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. And it is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. There shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. So the crazy thing is, the crowning of Joshua is a sign, as Lee observes, for the coming branch, which symbolizes the Davidic king. The Davidic king will coexist with the high priest by the peaceful understanding between the two of them. He will come and build the new temple. And that's what happens in verses 12 through 13. He shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord. There shall be a priest on his throne. Now, what we have here is we have a new priesthood. This is Old Testament prophecy. Think about it. We have a new priesthood. Got the people returned, they're cleansed from exile. Got a new priesthood. You got a temple that ultimately is going to be built by God's Spirit, and a priest who's crowned king, who is referred to as the branch, whose arrival leads to the, to the completion of a new temple project. Does that sound like anybody we know? It sounds an awful lot like Jesus. It sounds an awful lot like the returned Messiah. You know, so here again, we have, we have a conflation of all these ideas merging not into a building and then that's, that's it. They merge into a person. What, what temple does this priest, who is Jesus, preside over? I'll tell you what temple it is. It's the temple of his body. It's the temple, like all the other prophets say, it's the people of God. Now, a lot more could be said about all of this. We're going to wrap up here, you know, about all four prophets and, and other things. Again, again, this is Lee's dissertation. It's been made into a book if you're interested in the topic. But this should be sufficient. The New Jerusalem of Revelation 21 to 22 absorbs temple expectation. That is the expectation of the ultimate end of exile, ultimate forgiveness restoration of the dwelling place of God with his people, both in terms of a temple, but, but the land at, you know, at large, really the world, because there are no more nations to harass Israel. They've been judged. Chaos is over. He's the king of the whole world. All of these things are fulfilled in Revelation 21 and 22 by means of the new Jerusalem and the new earth. You have the new Jerusalem, which itself is linked to the new global Eden. And this isn't spiritualized interpretation. It's Old Testament. <laughs> it's, 
It's taking the Old Testament merger. The Old Testament is the one that merges these things in four prophets. You've got four examples here, and with the, the examples could easily be tripled if we went through Lee's whole dissertation, okay? It's the Old Testament that merges these ideas that have to do with new creation, new priesthood, presence of the Messiah, a new earth, and the people of God with the Messiah returned to earth. There's nothing going on in Revelation 21 and 22's vision of the new earth or new creation, whose temple is the body of Christ, in other words, Christ himself, whose roots cannot be found in the Old Testament. It's all there. And so next time, we're going to take a look at the chapter and go through it you know, in, in more granular detail and pull out some specific Old Testament things. But this is, this is the precursor. This is the Old Testament precedent. So if you have wondered why we get such weird abstract descriptions of the new city, why is it so big? I mean, it's, it's grotesquely big. It's impossibly big. And, and, you know, it like covers so much land and territory. And why, what, what's, what's up with this, you know, no more nations and the sea being no more. And all these things are designed to not be read literally, but to be read as more than literally. They are designed to be read in light of what the Old Testament does with temple language, the temple concepts. Doesn't mean that the Lord's not returning physically to earth. Doesn't mean that we, we, we won't see an earthly reign of Christ. We will. Again, I'm not going to rabbit trail back into Revelation 19. Okay, you know, uh, uh, the amillennial system looks, looks great except for the stuff they skip or, or don't deal with. And so does the dispensational premillennial system. It looks great unless you're looking at other things where it doesn't look so great. All the systems cheat. It's just, that's just the way it is. And nobody's going to arrest anybody for it, but that's just the way it is. So what we need to do is we need to look at, observe the fact that the Old Testament throws all of this in the hopper. It all goes into the same bucket. And these ideas get conflated with each other. They are prophecies and, and the content of Revelation 21 and 22 was never supposed to be read as the fulfillment of one building project. They are to be read as the culmination, the consummation of God's entire plan for his body, okay, the one family of God, and everything else, the end of chaos, all these things. So however we do that, that's our task, however we articulate that. We are not slaves to theological vocabulary or a system. We just want to look at what's there and try to think about it. And that's what our aim will be in the next episode. All right, Mike, looking forward to part two, wrapping it up finally. Don't forget, you still got uh, a chance to send me your Revelation question. We're going to do a whole Q&A in Revelation, Mike. We got lots of questions. This is your last chance to get yeah. them in. And uh, looking forward to wrapping it up. And uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 